This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM 99 Raw Dog and the Laugh Button Podcast Network. Dan Natterman here. I'm with Perry L. Ashenbrand, the producer of the show, and of course, Noam Dorman, the owner of the world famous comedy seller. We have Alan Dershowitz will be joining us in about 20 minutes. I'm not exactly sure what Noam wants to talk to him about because I sent him about four emails asking, but he didn't respond to them. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you handle the first questions, Dan. I'm going to give you first crack at Dershowitz because you, you were, you, I mean, I'm happy to have him on. I love Dershowitz, but you, you were anxiously t- asking for him. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you run out the time and then I'll add whatever I want to add. Well, I was anxious mostly because I thought, uh, you, you know, he'd be interesting for for you to talk to. Yeah, for all of us. I mean, we have one right here about Israel, about uh, cancel culture, about censorship, about um, Chauvin, about, uh, um, well, whatever else. Go ahead. So well, in any case, but no more Chauvin. I mean, enough with Chauvin. We beat I just him want to hear death. a little bit about Chauvin. We be- as, let's as, play as, it you to said the- that last time, and then we wound up having a whole nother show about him. Well, you know, it's, it is it is an interesting issue, but I, I want to hear how, how he... Um, what do you have to say about Chauvin as it pertains to his general um, feeling that the left has turned away from civil liberties? So go ahead. Anyway, um, so I did want to talk briefly about uh, we had a Hall of Fame, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee at the Comedy Cellar just a couple of nights ago on Monday night. Monday night, they do music. They used to do it on Friday pre-pandemic. Now every Monday at the Olive Tree Cafe, which is the restaurant above the Comedy Cellar, Noam and his merry band of musician friends do treat us to two or three hours of some of the best hits from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2K. And Donald Fagan was there with his friend. I listen to a lot of serious uh, XM uh, radio, so I, I pick up the lingo. It's amazing. Um, Donald Fagan, the uh, lead singer of Steely Dan, keyboard player from Steely Dan, was here with Fred Kaplan, who's an old friend of Noam's. And uh, they listened to the music, and they also came to see the show. So first, Noam, I want to ask if 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 uh, if you talked to Donald Fagan and if he had any words to say about you you and the musicians that were performing. Well, I, I did speak to him. He he of course complimented us, but um, but that's you know could have just been diplomatic. But uh, I got I heard afterwards from Fred Kaplan that he says he says those guys are really good, and he he asked um, if we had any original material. He was interested to hear it. So he also came down to see the show. And, and I was on that show. And during my set, he was in the back, so it was a little dark and hard to see. But every time I looked over to him, it seemed to me, as best I could tell, that he was absolutely stone-faced. <laughs> yeah, and, he's, uh, he's stone-faced, but he's a stone-faced kind of guy, even on stage a little bit. Well, and also, so I said, well, I don't know if he's enjoying this. It could be me. He maybe he doesn't like stand-up in general. But after the show, Fred Kaplan came over and, and, and with uh, Donald Fagan, and Fred just said to me, hey, Dan, good job, and did not introduce me to Donald Fagan, nor did Donald Fagan seem to have any interest in saying hello. So I take that as a bad sign insofar as Donald Fagan's appreciation of my act, not that it much matters. Did you do well? I did very well, yeah. And I'm sure he thought you were- were... Objectively speaking, I did well. I'm sure he thought you were funny. No, he he was a little, listen, it's, it's hard for those guys. They're super famous. They know everybody's watching them to see their reaction. So it, it puts them ill at ease. How old is he now? He's 73, but he's not like he's famous, but I, and yet I don't think many people recognize. I mean, I would have no everybody. Idea. So many people recognized him. It was it's crazy. People. The musicians are just regular folks. Comedians, musicians, people. I would he, have no idea. I mean, he's a guy that really does not look like a star of, mm-hmm. of all the, he, I mean, of all the people in the rock and roll hall of fame, he looks like, the least rock and roll uh, of all of them. First of all, among musicians, he he packs a wallop. I mean, this guy is highly respected. Oh, uh, I'm sure. By musicians, uh, but and not just and across genres, like you know, black people respect him, jazz musicians respect him, pop musicians respect him. It's it's a very unique place that he has in music. Well, yeah, I, I have no doubt about that. I'm just saying the general public. I don't know if like Mick Jagger walks in and it would be like, oh my god. I mean, the people would. You, you know, would be you'd hear audible gasping, but I, I mean, I don't think that Donald Fagan has that kind of reaction on the average. No, the no average Jew, person. no Jew does. Yeah, you're right. He's too Jewy. <laughs> Alan Dershowitz <laughs> does. Alan Dershowitz has that. Well, kind Paul of Paul Simon does it somewhat. Dylan, I Kravitz does. He's a Jew. Well, because he's half black, and so that gives him a lot more coolness 
No, but Dylan, uh, Dylan, Dylan is Dylan's got to be our poster yeah, child. D- for- Dylan, Dylan might evoke that kind of reaction. Yeah, I mean, not not um, in my home, not, not not with my father. He he didn't feel that way, but um, yeah, to the rest of the world. Um, do we want to talk about uh, Hunter Biden briefly? What, what about this Jeff Singer thing? Well, because we were, we were going to talk about that next week with Mayron, but, but if you want to if you want to broach the subject and we'll go in further in depth next week, Jeff Singer is a long time. He used to be my um, agent, by the way. He was at Abrams Artist. Um, then he became the booker of the Montreal Comedy Festival. And then he resigned recently because I don't know the full story. Apparently he used the N word. He was quoting somebody and they told him, I think this happened at the stand or at Gotham, wherever it happened. He was quoting somebody saying so-and-so said the N word, but he actually used the word. And they said, Jeff, please don't say that. So they, you know, they gave him one free pass. And then apparently from what I hear, he continued to say it like, I guess in a joking way, like what? I can't say, mm, what are you talking about? I should be able to say, mm. I guess he was trying to be funny or provocative, whatever. Mayron went on Facebook or on Twitter and, and told the story. And then a bunch of other comics, and not a bunch, a few, came forward and said, well, Jeff was, you know, he was uh, rude to me or he told me, you know, a lot of female comics said that he said things that were, they felt were sexist. Like, you know, you should wear, you shouldn't wear boots with that skirt, you know. <laughs> Uh, things of that nature that, you know, that he booked comics based, uh, female comics based on their physical appearance, whatever. So I, I'm, that- laugh- I'm laughing not because I'm laughing at the at the outrageous arrogance of him to say such things. I'm not laughing that I think they, they shouldn't complain. I'm like, who do I mean, you was, guys? Was that really a thing, the boots and the skirt? Or were you well, that's what I read on Twitter. Was. But I'm happy to hear Jeff Singer's defense if he has one, if he's Can we get him to- on. Well, I can try to. I can ask. You can him. try. My sense is that he probably is in hiding somewhere. Well, I mean, they're, they're calling this sex. Happy to have him on. My question is, um, was he known to give these kind of, uh, you know, pontificating edicts of of style and criticism uh, to all comedians or just to female comedians? Because you know, it, it is different. If he if he says dumb things to every comic then it makes it look less bad when he says it just to a woman. But if he just if he just feels open season on women, um, you know, that's worse. Well, I'd also like to know he booked the new faces, which, you know, the uh, I don't know if he he didn't book everything at the festival. I don't think maybe he did. But, we, we you know, it'd also be interesting to see who he booked over the years. I mean, was it was it all, you know, young, skinny girls, you know, that are conventionally attractive? I mean, I, I'd want to see that data before I, you know, pronounced that he was necessarily sexist, maybe in word, but but was he also sexist sexist indeed, as well as word, and 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 who that was has, relevant. Has, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, that would be relevant to my analysis of of Jeff Singer. But in any case, he's resigned and he's no longer the booker there. But who has so, such cojones and such arrogance that they they quote the N word to some black people, and this is in two thousand. 21 this isn't you know a time when you could plead ignorance as to whether you thought it was okay to quote but you're not supposed to do that now but okay so so you do it because you think maybe you're close enough or whatever it is and you and you can have this conversation and they say to you please don't do that it disturbs me and you dig in and you argue with them and you use it again and again that is just i mean that's yeah that i mean it's outrageous but again, he's not here and we're happy to hear from him if he has a different side to the story. Well, he I resigned, guess. he apologized, so. Yeah, so he probably, that's probably what happened relatively accurately. Uh, but uh, yes, I, there's no explaining, unless, I mean, if he was blind drunk, that would at least be an explanation, if not an excuse, uh, you know, and maybe, but, but, but yes, I agree, that's outrageous. And um, I mean, I've known him for, I've known him. He, he he was originally the way he started, at least when I met him, he was Dave Becky's when Dave Becky was also embroiled in some controversy. But in any case, he was Dave Becky's assistant like 25 years ago. That's when I first met him. I uh, I, I think I had like a meeting with Dave Becky uh, briefly, you know, to talk about working together, which never happened. But in any case, that's how he started. Then he was an agent at Abrams Artist. He was my agent at Abrams Artist. And then I don't know what he, then I think he booked Jimmy Fallon for a brief period of time as well. So now I want to talk to Mayron. Now Mayron is um, uh, wonderful and he 
you know, so, so this morphed into Guy Branham on Twitter, once again, bashing the comedy seller for not being uh, sufficiently open to gays or something. You know? And Mehran tore him a new asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, Mehran just ripped him apart. God bless Mehran for defending us because, because it, it was absurd. There was one show that had- uh, he, rela uh, he related the Jeff Singer incident to, to the comedy seller, uh, Guy Branham did? No, but somehow Guy Branham brought it back around. And, and um, I, I have, I have, I screenshotted it somewhere. But so Mehran's like, listen, we had a show with um, uh, uh, Sam J, Paris Sache, Mehran, all on the same show and Godfrey, you know, like, so like- Four out of six of the acts were uh, either were gay or black or both, and he's like, "What? What are you talking about?" He says he sits at the table every day, but this guy, Guy Branham, won't give it up. This guy is a real creep. All right, I mean, there's enough of this guy already. I've I've done everything I can to be nice to him. After the podcast, I invited him to go on stage. I um, I I invited him to go who on. Who is like, he? Who is this guy? I don't. Know I, I invited him to go on. He's a guy who wrote an article in Vulture dot com saying that the comedy seller didn't allow gay and trans at the table and we were the the boys club that that was responsible for louis ck and the the, the sexist homophobic and so then you and so he said all this and then you and invited him we did the stuff. podcast with him and podcast it was probably him. one of our best episodes not uh, that was before yeah, and that, we had we had like we had all the gay comics that have traditionally worked at the committee at, at the comedy seller there to tell him no actually the Comedy Cellar was the only place that was always open to gays and always had gays performing there. And and you you and he admitted he'd never been to the Comedy Cellar before when he wrote the article. He had no knowledge of anything. He, but I thought we settled it. And then afterwards, I'm really I, sorry to interrupt you, Noam. I apologize. I think Alan Dershowitz is here. Okay. Well, we'll have Mayron on. I Let me just finish what I said. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm. I don't, I, don't, I don't want him to leave and think that um you, you have what you can message him okay it's okay well we'll have mayron on next week and we will get to the bottom we will get the introduction yes of course I, I don't i i can do it from memory alan dershowitz where, where is he is he's not on screen there he is alan dershowitz, <laughs> alan dershowitz who is no stranger to the comedy seller he's been to a couple of our debates uh, anyway, Alan Dershowitz is here. I mean, I don't need to introduce him because he's yes, he needs so well known, but I'll do it anyway. He was a professor at Harvard Law for over 40 years. He's written several best selling books, including Chutzpah, uh, Reversal of Fortune, which was made into a movie, uh, which I saw when I was in college at the theater in uh, Philadelphia and enjoyed it very much. Um, he wrote The Case for Peace, The Case for Israel, which Noam's father bought a stack of them and handed it out to everybody. Um, and most recently, his book, uh, Periel. Periel. Oh, brother, guys. What's, what's the name of his most recent? What's the name of his most recent book, Professor? It's called The Case Against the New Censorship. Fighting back big corporations, big tech, universities, and progressives. Well, it's okay. It's it's a pleasure to have you on our show, sir. And I know, I know uh, we all have questions for you, but Dan, I'm gonna let you go first. Well, Thank first you. of all, yes. First of all, uh, welcome once again. You've been here before. You were at a couple of our debates. Yeah, and, and we're planning, and I think we're planning another one. Uh, we're gonna try to have another one on uh, the Middle East and peace and all of that. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I have to apologize. I was eating a chocolate bar tonight and it cracked one of my teeth. So I look like I just got out of a bar fight. But uh, it was an innocent chocolate bar, not a bar fight. I think well, it gives you a kind of machismo that uh, that is winning. I I, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, verbal sparring you're known for, bar fighting less so. <laughs> but I can't even see from where I'm sitting that there's a, an issue there, a dental uh, issue of any kind. Have you ever? I just wanted to ask you also if you've ever been to the actual comedy cellar. If you've ever seen a comedy show here. Of course, of course I have. I participated in at least one debate there. I've been to two or three uh, comedy events. I love stand-up comedy. Um, you know, had I not been a law professor, who knows? Um, you know, uh, Woody Allen and I grew up just a few blocks away from each other, and we're uh, almost the same age. And Larry David, uh, a lot of good comics uh, came out of uh, Brooklyn in the 19. Uh, 40s and 50s. So, you know, I have I have the heritage. I just don't have the 
great sense of humor that they have. <laughs> well, there is a there is some overlap. Well, you might have had you cultivated it. Who knows? But there is some overlap between law and comedy. I have a law degree. Uh, the late Greg Giraldo had had a law degree. Um, there are several other comics. I believe Mike Royce, not Mike Royce, Mike Sweeney. But now right no comic, ha no comic dares to go to a university. If they go to a university, they're going to get canceled. They're going to get yelled at. I used to sprinkle my classes in criminal law with humor uh, all the time. Uh, today, you can't do that. I'll give you an example. Once in class, a student, we were talking about affirmative action. And in Canada, to be the beneficiary of affirmative action, you have to be a visible minority, a visible minority. So a student, Professor Dershowitz, are Jews a visible minority? I said, no, we're an audible minority. <laughs> and uh, I got complaints. You know, that's a stereotype. Of course, it's a stereotype. All ethnic humor is a stereotype. All Jewish jokes are based on stereotypes. And, uh, you know, if you want humor, you have to have a little bit of stereotyping. I must say that's a pretty good joke, I think. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. You know, I, I give that. Um, and, and when, what, I, when did you do that? What year was that that you that you oh, got in so trouble you, for that? About 10 years ago, probably 10, 10 years, years ago. ago. Okay. You know, I taught at Harvard for 50 years. The first 45, there wasn't this problem. But then I would say the last five years, and now I've been retired about five, the problem has gotten greater. Um, I just wrote an article about how robots don't have a sense of humor. You know, robots now censor on the major uh, uh, high tech networks, their robotic censorship. And there were some cases where cartoons didn't make it through because the robot didn't understand the difference between advocating uh, racism or advocating violence and mocking the advocacy of racism and violence. So, you know, we have robots now telling us what humor is and um, it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous. And so this is the new censorship you're talking about in your, in your book? Yeah, because the old censorship was by the government. I never lost a case against the government. We always won. I represented Hare. I represented I Am Curious Yellow. I represented the Pentagon Papers. I represented Deep Throat. Represented, you know, everybody. We always won because the First Amendment was on our side. But the private censors, the big tech censors, the First Amendment is on their side. They can pick and choose who they censor and who they don't censor. And we don't have a legal leg to stand on. That's why we have to be fighting back in the court of public opinion rather than in the courts of law. So you, you uh, having thought it through, I'm sure, um, and looked for any angle, you see no legal recourse against big tech in their ability to censor however they want? Oh, yeah, there is some legal recourse, but the legal recourse may be worse than the problem. I mean, the legal recourse would include antitrust laws, would include trying to call them common carriers. You know, the telegraph company, for example, can't say we only accept Republican telegraphs, not Democrat telegraphs. They're open to everybody. So Justice Thomas has said, maybe they're a common carrier. I think those are problematic as well. Uh, there's this section 230 that gives the big tech exemption from all kind of defamation suits on the ground that they're just a platform. And of course, logically, if you're just a platform, you can't be held responsible for what people put on you if you don't pick and choose. But if you become a publisher, if you're no longer a platform, if you're like the comedy club, the comedy club picks and chooses which comedians it's going to have on. And if you have on a comedian who commits all kinds of defamatory acts, you're not exempt. But the big tech are exempt. And so there's a movement now to restrict that, to give big tech a choice. Look, you want to be a platform? Fine, then you can't censor. You get the exemption. But if you want to censor, then you're no longer a platform, you're a publisher, and you're covered by the same rules that cover the Comedy Club, the New York Times, and CNN. What, what do you and think? Your, wait, I'm sorry, so what's your position on that? You, you, uh, you I think it's a good idea to limit Section 230 to real platforms. Um, there are a number of new platforms now that don't censor, and they should get the benefit of that. But if you know Facebook is having the Supreme Court of Facebook, deciding what can be put on or what can't be put on. Here's the problem. When you tell the readers of Facebook that they can't hear a debate between Alan Dershowitz and Robert Kennedy, we had a debate about whether vaccination should be compulsory. I'm in favor of compulsory vaccinations, if necessary. Bobby Kennedy is against it. It was a very good debate. YouTube took it down. 
saying, we don't want you to hear both sides of that debate. You know, if, if you can do that, uh, then I don't think you should get the exemption. If you can pick and choose who you should put on. Now, you know, if you had a debate, I mean, I can imagine you having a debate at the comedy uh, uh, cellar about, you know, compelled vaccinations. It would be a very interesting debate, uh, but nobody should censor that. Right. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. No. So, so, I mean, there's a difference that a lot of people don't seem to understand when we get into debates about free speech on Twitter and, and mostly Twitter, I guess it is. Uh, and Facebook, I guess, and Instagram, Instagram is more people, you know, sh shaking their butts and it's, it's, yeah. it's less serious. Generally it's in it, Twitter, but in any case, you know, people make the argument, well, um, the first amendment doesn't apply because it's not the government. That's very sure. true. But but we're not talking about the First Amendment as a law. We're talking about it as a concept. And the question right. is, is what is best for the society? Free I agree with you. I talk about the First Amendment culture, freedom of speech culture, the marketplace of ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, first they come after the comedians. That's always been the case. First, they come after the comedians because the comedians are the ones who are at the forefront of provocation. They did that in Nazi Germany. They did that in communism. They did that in Castro's Cuba. The first, they come after the comedians. Second, they come after the lawyers, which is interesting. Um, and, um, and that's why I think it's so important that we preserve the culture of freedom of speech, even if the First Amendment doesn't apply. And that's why, you know, the Comedy Cellar and other institutions like yours are so important because the government can't tell you what to do. Well, but but the truth of the matter is, is, you know, we we we, um, you know, we're not Noam, who's the owner. He does not censor us. He does not tell us, don't say this, right. don't say that. But the audience is there to to in, to impose their will on us. And if they're not laughing, uh, you know, because ultimately it's about getting laughter. Of course. So if they're not laughing, if they're uncomfortable, if they're you know, that's not going censorship, to, Dan. That's, that's it's not it's not censorship. But the but the point is, is 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 this is the notion that a comedy club is just all kinds of ideas that are flowing and things that you'll you just won't hear anywhere else. I, I think that's somewhat exaggerated. I, well, it depends on the time. I remember when the comedy clubs had people like Mott Saul and um, what's the name of the guy who eventually died of heroin overdose? Um, Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce, they weren't funny. Uh, you know, you had to have an acquired taste for them. Certainly, I remember coming and listening to Lenny Bruce read from the transcript of his trial. And, you know, every so often you'd get a snicker, but it wasn't funny. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are comedians who really, you know, I, I would, uh, are, are, are not, uh, their major contribution is not getting the laugh. It's mm -hmm. making a point. It's making a point through comedy that maybe you don't get the joke until you get home that night. Um, and, you know, there are some late night comics now who are politicians and, you know, make, you know railing against Israel, railing against America, railing against um, many other values. And it's not funny, but people watch them. And a lot of people get their news today through late night comics. And so comedy transcends just the ha ha laugh. Well, and I, I mean, Dan is kind of implying something that I don't agree with, which is I think the audiences are quite open to hearing people tell jokes from all points of view, yeah. much more than people might suspect if they think that, you know, woke culture has taken over everything. And there's comedians like Andrew Schultz, Professor, I don't know if you're familiar with these guys, but yeah. they're, they're, you know, they're making big careers for themselves by talking about the things they're not supposed to talk about. I agree with you. They're quite acceptable and to our audience. Professor, but it's not just the culture of the First Amendment, is it? There used to be a spirit of the entire Bill of Rights, which was kind of transferred yeah. as a social norm through everything we did. Even as a boss, the way I would treat my employees was informed by, I, I had much more latitude, but I still was always informed by the kind of innocent to proven guilty oh, and due process. Yes. And, and, and I'm sure there's other examples. And, and we've kind of turned away from the spirit of the entire Bill of Rights through our societies, correct? I think that's right. And I think seeing everything today through racial terms, critical racial theory, and the people who are announcing critical racial theories say essentially 
We don't have a sense of humor. We don't believe in liberal values. We don't believe in, you know, the, 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 the old joke, uh, how, many, how many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? That isn't funny. Well, that is funny, actually. Um, and, and uh, you know, the idea that we're being told by critical race theory that we can't laugh, that you can laugh at certain jokes if you're black, but you can't even think about laughing at them if you're white. Um, I, I hope you're right that there are audiences out there that are prepared to laugh at anything that's, that's funny and prepared to give a pass. Even if it's not funny, if you tried, if you tried hard and you made an effort and, uh, you know, it, if it didn't horribly, horribly uh, insult people on racial or gender grounds. Um, look, there are limits. Uh, when, when President Trump mocked somebody who was disabled, for me, that went beyond my limits of any kind of acceptable uh, speech. And I wouldn't accept a comedian um, mocking somebody for a disability either. But you know, that should be self-censorship. That should be something that you impose on yourself. Today, if somebody tried to mock somebody at, in the cellar, they'd be booed. Um, and that's the ultimate. The ultimate uh, uh, response is the boo or the walkout. Now, and, and, and you know, so we had our situation with Louis C.K. I don't know if you followed it where we're- Of course, very much so. And, yeah. But what was interesting about that is, um, despite the fact that I had threats against me and against my business and even uh, kind of veiled threats against my children and horrible articles written about me and all kinds of stuff, business did not um, suffer one bit, which no. made me begin to think, although I didn't have this impression going into it, I was scared that, you know, I don't really know how many people are really on board with this. There's kind of a Wizard of Oz phenomenon going on with Twitter where you see this big guy, but you don't know, is there just one small group of people behind the curtain? Do you have a feel well, for I think some of that? Look, I spoke for years at the 92nd Street Y. I was the second most popular speaker in the history of the 92nd Street Y, only Ellie Wiesel more. I spoke probably 30 times and I packed the audience every time. Then I was accused of having sex with a woman I never met and never heard of, proved conclusively beyond any doubt by her own emails and her own lawyers and her own tape recordings that she never met me. And the 92nd Street Y canceled me. They said, we know you didn't do it. We know there's nothing to it, but there are six or seven people who would be offended and they're on our board. So I said to them, yeah, but there are a thousand people who want to hear me there are six people who don't want to hear me. Why are you canceling me? Well, the six people who don't want to hear you are going to make trouble. Yeah. So that's the way it works. That's the way McCarthyism worked. I don't think McCarthyism was that popular with the general audience. I don't think it, the people out there cared about you know, the front, that uh, uh, there were people who had, may have been communists in the 1930s uh, who were writing brilliant uh, stuff, Dalton Trumbo and others. But McCarthy cared. And he threatened the networks and he threatened the television studios and the movie studios and a, a small number of people brought about McCarthyism. And I think you may be right. You may be onto something that it's not a large number of people. For example, if you were to invite Woody Allen to come down and do an evening of stand up, it would pack the place. People would boo. People would be outside. People would be protesting. But everybody would want to hear him. He's, you know, he's the greatest stand up comic of our generation. Yeah. Well, that I don't know if I even though I have the courage to 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 bring Woody Allen there, but yeah, but but I do I do resent the fact that um that because it, it goes how do I put this? It went beyond just the idea that people disapprove. People actually felt the right to say that okay, if you have a a, a willing performer and a willing audience that wants to see him, this is still our business. We still have the right to say you shouldn't be doing this, and that I couldn't understand. I agree all. with. You can protest, you can stand outside, you can come in and boo uh, or not laugh. But the one thing you can't do is stop people from listening. I just wrote an article this, this week, I'm publishing it in a new book that I have. Um, by the way, 47 books, not just 30, 47 books. And 47 I taught it books, yeah. 50 years, not 40 years. So let's get it straight. <laughs> so uh, I think I said over 40 years. Oh, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, it's just it's just what's going on today is so, so dangerous. And I wrote an article saying the First Amendment has two elements. We forget about that. The right of the speaker to speak. Yeah, everybody knows that, but the right of the listener to listen or the viewer to view, the right of the audience is very important. 
Yes. And when you cancel somebody, you're not only canceling them, you're denying the audience the right to read their book. Look at what happened now with Philip Roth. Philip Roth is a great writer. Uh, look, the greatest, the greatest book review title ever done was the New York Times review of Portnoy's complaint. Do you remember what the title was? No. The Gripes of Roth. <laughs> it was fantastic. Look, Philip Roth is, was fantastic. And somebody wrote a biography of him. And, uh, but the guy who wrote the biography was accused. And so uh, Norton and Company, I think it was, withdrew the biography. So I can't read a biography now of Philip Roth. I want to read it. I wanted to read Woody Allen's biography. Fortunately, when one of the companies withdrew it, another company published it. And it's very funny. Uh, and I'm glad I had a chance to read it. Doesn't mean I have to agree with everything that Woody Allen has said or done in his lifetime, but I don't agree with everything Dostoevsky has done in his lifetime. Dostoevsky was a virulent anti-Semite. He wrote an article called The Jewish Question in which he accused the Jews of, you know, trying to control the world. Oh, I mean, it could have appeared in, 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 in one of Goebbels' writings, but I still love Dostoevsky. So, you know, there are no heroes. Everybody has clay feet. Uh, Nelson well, Mandela... Well, of terrorism. Mahatma Gandhi was a racist when he lived in South Africa. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln, when he won the Lincoln-Douglas debates, called for the blacks to be freed so they could be sent back to Africa. You know, there are no heroes. There are no perfect people. So let's stop demanding perfection of our people. If, if you were a businessman, you were the owner of the, the company that was going to publish Woody Allen's book, or if you were Netflix, and you had to make a decision whether to uh, publish a book or air a special that you thought was going to be bad for business. Um, I mean, can you blame these companies for doing what they think is in their best interest, even if it's not in the best interest of society to censor, it's in their best interest as businessmen not to well, I, not. I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong from the point of view of business. I think they're making short term business decisions, not long term business decisions. I think it's from a long term point of view, it's much better for a publisher to have a reputation as being somebody who will publish things they disagree with, the Voltaire approach. I disagree with what you're saying, but I will defend to the death your right to publish it. You know, there are limits, obviously. You don't publish manuals about how to make an atomic bomb or how to you know, do things uh, that are clearly illegal. But within the parameters of what's acceptable, I think publishers shouldn't be subject to the veto of their employers. And when Simon & Schuster was thinking of not publishing the book by vi former vice president, they weren't doing it on business grounds. They were doing it because some of their editors didn't want to be associated with any book that came out of the Trump administration. So, um, you know, and it, it, censorship today is being used against the right. Yesterday it was used against the left. When I was in college, I was the president of the student government at Brooklyn College, and I hated communism, but I defended the rights of communists. And, um, and, and, and I always stood up for the rights of, I defended the rights of Nazis to march through Skokie, even though Nazis murdered many of my relatives. That's what free speech is about. It's not free speech for me, but not for thee. It's free speech for everybody. Yeah, I mean, as an employer, because as an employer, it would be very helpful to me as an employer if they would just make it illegal for me to fire somebody based on their political points of view. Uh, it would be such a, because, you know, I had, I remember years ago, I had a musician who was uh, wearing a Farrakhan, proudly wearing a Farrakhan t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Right at the time when he was saying all these, uh, really yeah. the, his greatest hits about the Jews. And I chose to just let it go. What am I going to do? But if I, I, if, if I fired him for that, I'd be a villain. On the other hand, if I didn't fire somebody who wore a mirror image white guy's t-shirt, I'd be a yeah. villain for that too. I prefer to say, listen, you're, you guys just do your jobs. I don't care what you believe in. I, I agree with you. And I've told all universities to do that. Take the taxi cab approach to freedom of speech. First guy who hails the cab gets in the cab. They can't refuse to take you where you want to go. Um, and that's the way it should be at universities. I call it the circle of civility. If yeah. you're going to say you can't have speech on one side, you have to say it on the other. Look at what happened recently where a woman, a black woman psychiatrist, gave a lecture at the Yale Child Study Center. And she said what she really fantasizes about is taking a gun and, and blowing up the head of white people, because white people are. And then she went and said all kinds of things about white people, which if somebody ever said about black people, you know, they would never be allowed to speak. But 
Yale has a different standard for what a black person could say about a white person from what a white person could say about a black person. Well, maybe that has to be tolerated for a while. Uh, obviously, we can tell jokes, women can tell jokes, stereotyping men more easily than a man can tell a joke, stereotyping women. And there's a little room for affirmative action, kind of to make up for all the years in which there was such discrimination based on gender and based on race. But there comes a time when really quality, Martin Luther King type equality, I dream at a time when my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's what I hope for. What, what bothers me about that and all of that is that just as um, on an intellectual basis, these people are normalizing everything which they claim to despise. Forget about whether they can get away with it, we allow it, we don't allow it. How can you devote your life to uh, fighting racism and then just embrace the very notions of collective guilt and judging people on the color of their skin and immutable characteristics without even being embarrassed about it. How, how is how are they not laughed out of court? Like what's going on? Well, they not only are not laughed out of court, they teach courses on it. Yeah. Critical race theory, which says basically you should judge people by the color of their skin. That identity is everything that white people have to shut up. They've spoken too long. They have too much privilege. Listen to Black people, listen to Black women, listen to transgender people. Yeah, I want to listen to them all, of course. but I also want to hear what other people have to say. Um, but you are right. I mean, it, it, look, it, I, I have this new book called The Case for um, uh, Colorblind Equality at an Age of, of Identity Politics. And I start out with two things. Being at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, I was there. And then a few months later, having dinner with Malcolm X um, at, at, in Harvard Square. And the difference between the two of them and their two conceptions of racial equality is what has really defined this conflict that we now have. There are still a few who adopt Martin Luther King's view, let's eliminate discrimination and others who accept Malcolm X. No, let's have black pride, and black power and special privileges for black people. So we're never going to resolve that issue. We have to continue to debate it. And then, then how, and how do you explain this? So, so I mean, because I can understand uh, conceptually very well, even if I may not agree with every aspect of it, separating Black people off as a special case because of what we have done to them. This, this but then how do you defend separating Asians from white people? Like, wh wh why do they jump the barrier from something that makes sense into dividing every single other race up? What difference does well, it make? And, and, and look at what happened with Asian Americans. Not, it's nothing like slavery, but we brought them to the country to build a railroad. We treated them horribly on the West Coast. We detained 110,000 people in constant concentration camps, I hate to use that term because they weren't like Nazi concentration camps, they were literally camps that concentrated them. And, and we've treated them terribly. And, and, and so they have a gripe. Um, you know, when I was growing up in the 60s, I have to just brag a little bit to make my point. When I went to Yale Law School, I was first in my class, I was editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal, I was a star debater, I was going to be a Supreme Court law clerk and a Harvard professor, and I got turned down by 32 out of 32 Wall Street firms. Every single one of them turned me down. Only one of them gave me an interview. And the interview was given to me by a guy who turned out, I found out 20 years later, it was a closet Jew who wanted to meet me because he admired me to tell me that I wouldn't fit in with his law firm. And that's the way it was. We had systemic racism, systemic anti-gay, anti-woman, anti-Jew, anti-ethnic Catholic. Uh, remember in the 50s, nobody would dream that a Catholic could run for president. It took, obviously, John Kennedy to break that, that barrier. Uh, and you're right, Black uh, African Americans deserve special consideration because, as Martin Luther King put it, our Constitution was born with a birth defect. The birth defect was slavery. We accepted slavery in the Constitution. There's no denying that. And the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, though it abolished it, it didn't really abolish it. We immediately went to Jim Crow and we had Jim Crow for nearly a hundred years from the time of the end of the Civil War till basically the 1960s. And we're finally going, moving out of it. I don't believe today we are a systemically racist country. 
I believe today we are systemically anti-racist with pockets of racism that have to be addressed, particularly in law enforcement. But if you look at the laws today, the Supreme Court decisions, we're systematically anti-racist. We're struggling with racism from the bottom up. It's not the way it was from the top down. And, you know, but there's a big difference between systemic racism of what we had up to the 60s and what we have now, which is something different than that. I, I generally agree with you, although I have to tell you that when I heard the full details of what Mayor Bloomberg's uh, stop and frisk policies were and the way they were pulling over black kids for marijuana charges, they didn't really I care about. I, I, that was one case. I said, well, that, that sounds like systemic racism. You know, I don't but know let me tell you, let me tell you the opposite side of that. So I lived in Boston for many years, obviously. Um, and in Boston, we, there was a terrific problem of crime in the inner city, particularly among young people, gangs and young people. And a number of the black ministers got together with civil libertarians and with the mayor and said, look, you got to disarm these gangs. And they went into the neighborhoods and they did stop and frisk. I think they did it better than they did it in New York. They didn't do it on marijuana cases, et cetera. But they did. And they, they essentially disarmed. Um, uh, and, and it had a substantial, not, you know, not it didn't end the crime, but it had a substantial effect on, on crime. And, um, you know, what's the hardest thing in the world is to balance civil liberties against the need to stop uh, crime. And that's what's going on now with the mayoral race in New York. Um, you know, uh, some people want to defund the police. Some people want to increase funding for the police. Um, I think the mayoral uh, election will be determined a lot by the approach to crime and whether you can balance basic civil liberties with a need to protect innocent civilians from crime. Yeah, going back to my Wizard of Oz thing, I think you're going to find that New York City wants a mayor who's tough on crime, despite what the, the loud mouths are saying. I Look, I agree, agree with you. And, you know, that that's why, yeah, I, I do think that the former borough president of Brooklyn, who was a former policeman, has the the advantage now because I think he's seen as somebody who can balance civil liberties uh, and 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 also. Uh, being being tough. Also, we have to stop bullying cops. Uh, the too many cops have done too many bad things. I agree with that. But take the case, for example, of Kim Potter. Here's a woman, 27 years on the police force, never done anything wrong as far as we know. Terrible situation. She stops somebody. The guy has a record, gun, violence. He's about to get in the car and escape. She grabs what she believes is her taser and she yells, taser, taser, taser. She pulls the trigger and she says, oh, S-H-I, I shot him. And they're prosecuting her. And they want to prosecute her not only for manslaughter, but for murder. It was a tragic mistake. People make mistakes all the time. And we generally distinguish between honest mistakes and crimes. But yet the crowds are demanding that she be prosecuted for murder. I don't believe that. Well, I, I agree with you. And, and uh, well, two, two other things I want to ask you about. So get, since we're talking about this and, it, and it, um, it's intertwined with civil liberties, there are so many aspects of this Chauvin case. Oh, yeah. Which you would have thought the ACLU would have been all over. Or the ACLU, what is that? The Anti-Civil Liberties Union? <laughs> so, and I, I made a quick list. I've got like, that, that, that they didn't allow a venue change, despite the fact that the jurors' names would be coming out and, and Minnesota was surely going to descend into death, deadly riots if they, they didn't got... allow sequestration of the jury. Look, the ACLU, I just wrote an article called Requiem for the American Civil Liberties Union. I was on the national board of the ACLU during the golden age of civil liberties when the ACLU defended the free speech of Nazis, the free speech of communists, the free speech of the Klan. Today, the ACLU is one of the richest organizations in America. It has, it's just rolling in dough as the result of giving up on civil liberties. And it's nowhere to be found on college campuses anymore. Thank God there's an organization called FIRE, which is defending the rights of young students on college campuses. But they're not in the speech business. They're not in the due process business. They're in the political business. They're just like any other political organization. They pick their cases. They prioritize their cases based on politics, not on civil liberties, not on neutral civil liberties. The Chauvin case, look, what Chauvin did is 
the most horrible thing, unacceptable. There's no justification for it, particularly the last six minutes when obviously he is not resisting and he's dying and guy keeps his knee on his neck. But I don't believe he committed murder. I think he committed manslaughter. And I think that if not for the fear that the jurors had, that there would be riots in the street if they didn't come back with a murder verdict, I don't know. Um, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes during the Leo Frank case 100 years ago said, whether a person's guilty or innocent, you can't trust a verdict when the jurors are worried for their own safety if they come up with a verdict other than what the crowds want. And I think that's what's happened in the Chauvin case. And so I think there's a good chance the United States Supreme Court will reverse the Chauvin conviction, send it back for a new trial with a sequestered jury which doesn't get to hear Maxine Waters threaten confrontation but, unless there's a murder verdict. But isn't the Supreme Court also subject to the same fears? Uh, they don't want to go down in history as the people, uh, and they don't want to be reviled, the Supreme Court doesn't, uh, for, for overturning this verdict. I mean, to what extent is that going to weigh on their decision? Well, it's a year from now, number one. It's Washington, D.C. It's not Minneapolis. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's now a conservative court. The, isn't it interesting, when I was a law clerk on the Supreme Court, it was the liberals who defended free speech rights and the liberals who defended due process rights. Now it's going to be more likely the conservatives uh, who will say, gee, maybe this wasn't a, a fair trial. Uh, but you're right. I mean, nobody wants to be the judge that caused a riot in which six people were killed. Nobody wants to be that judge. Dershowitz, I, Professor Dershowitz, I know you probably have to go soon. I'm, I'm, in, I'm really. I'm, I'm, I'm in, oh, I'm great! So I, by the way, I forgot to mention you also have a show on YouTube called The Der Show, which yeah, uh, which, it's on hiatus now. We're trying to move it to a, a different format, so um, give it another couple of weeks and then tune in to The Der Show. Yeah, I, but I, it was, it's an excellent show, and 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 you did a lot of stuff on Chauvin yeah. and stuff on impeachment as well that I watched. And it was very informative. So, so that'll be coming back, I said, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So, by the way, let me just tell the listeners on the, on the issue of Chauvin, because it's such a sensitive topic. Nobody here is, um, what we're discussing is the, are, the, are the elements of what it means to have a fair trial. And, and, when you, and that doesn't matter whether the guy is guilty or innocent. And that's what traditionally what the Civil Liberties Union was all about. It, they, they would happily defend KSM and Abu Jamal and anybody they could find and the Nazis. So don't confuse uh, our concern for the fairness of the Chauvin trial to be some sort of defense of Chauvin. It's not. No, no, no. Do you want it? And I don't think anybody can defend what Chauvin did. I think what he did was just unbelievable. Look, he changed the world. Uh, that, that event, those nine minutes, had as much of an impact on race relations, civil rights, as anything in, in my memory. And uh, it, it was a transformative event. And largely it was because it was videotaped and, and everybody in the world, not only in America, but in the world could see the life being squeezed out of this man by a policeman who obviously was not doing the right thing. So nobody here is defending Chauvin, but the, the hardest cases to have civil liberties are cases where it's so clear that the person is a bad person who did a bad thing. Is it but yet, who, who, would, who would want to be on trial for their life and have, know that the juror before he before the trial was wearing a T-shirt about your guilt? Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I can't even I mean, is, is it ever worth sacrificing a civil liberty or two to, to prevent complete uh, social chaos? I don't think so. I think that, you know, once you do that once, you know, everybody thinks their case or their era is different. Everybody thinks they, they are living in the most traumatic times. And once you allow an exception, as we did when we detained 110,000 Japanese Americans, it set a terrible, terrible precedent. And, and I just think we can't have those precedents. Everybody has to have a fair trial. And, and you know, you, you, you can't allow the crowd to dictate justice. Uh, it, it's hard because nobody wants riots, nobody wants violence. But um, you know, today the violence would be over the Chauvin case, tomorrow it could be over something else. I mean, let's assume it isn't Chauvin, let's assume it's Kim Potter, who is innocent. I mean, totally innocent. She made a mistake, but she's innocent. Do we wanna sacrifice her as well? Because I think there would be violence 
if she wasn't prosecuted and if she wasn't convicted. All right. And let me just also say for people who will listen to the show, I had problems with the causation part of the case against Chauvin. I, I thought that, that so much contradiction between the experts. I, I so, but I'm not going to debate that now. I just want the listeners to think I'm chickening out or bringing but that I, up. That, now. that was a close enough question that I think that I would sustain the jury verdict on that. Where I think the, the issue, the major issue in the case is, is the threats to the jurors and whether they perceive the threats. Noam, Noam, do you want to talk? Uh, I want to ask about Israel. Yeah, I was sure. going to say you have a debate coming up. Well, but I want to. What about Israel? And, I'm just trying and, to relate it to the comedy. Yeah. So, so you yeah. know, you, you still say that you're a Democrat, and um, so I and I I wonder about that. I think about you a lot, Professor Dershowitz, and I want to say, in his heart of hearts, is he still a Democrat? If if this was a young 25 year old Alan Dershowitz with all the same views that he has now, could he possibly embrace the Democratic Party? I don't I don't think he could. I don't know if I can embrace the Democratic Party, but I can certainly embrace Joe Biden. I can certainly embrace Kamala Harris. I can certainly embrace uh, Tony Blinken. I can certainly embrace Janet Yellen. I can certainly embrace the current administration. I am a big fan of Joe Biden. I think he's doing a great job in trying to bring people uh, together. Um, and um, But I can't embrace you know, the squad. I can't embrace um, some of the people who are running now for mayor of New York or for district attorney of New York. I can't embrace my former colleague, Elizabeth Warren. Um, no, but I can't embrace the Republicans either. I believe in a woman's right to cho choose. I believe in gay marriage. I believe in reasonable gun control. I believe in separation of church and state. I am a traditional liberal, and I'm not ready to say what Ronald Reagan said. He said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. It's possible the Democratic Party will leave me. I'm almost 83 years old, so there's not that much time left for them to leave me, but there's still enough. If they do leave me, I will be very upset. I want to see the Democratic Party join the Republican Party in bipartisan support for Israel. Let's turn to Israel for just one second, because I think Hamas is suckering the world. What they do is about every seven years, they figure out an excuse for firing rockets at Israel. They know that Israel is going to have to respond by firing rockets back. They know that they're firing rockets from UN schools, from hospitals, from mosques. They know that there are going to be some innocent people killed. And they're ready with what they call the CNN strategy or the dead baby strategy. They're willing to sacrifice 200 civilians in order to get the world to turn against Israel. And it's so easy to get the world to turn against Israel. Just fire rockets at Israel kill on the first or second day, they killed the six-year-old boy who was in a bunker and the rocket came through the bunker, killed the boy and killed and almost killed his mother. And Israel responds. They take as much care as they possibly can, but inevitably they're going to kill some innocent civilians because Hamas uses the innocent civilians as shields. This has happened now four times. I've written four books on this subject. And, and doesn't the world get it? that Hamas just has figured out a way of getting you to the New York Times to put the 60 children on the front page of the newspaper. Well, it turns out that 10 or so of the children were killed by Hamas rockets. Uh, several others were not 14, they were 18 or 17 and they were Hamas fighters, but you don't need an explanation. You see that picture and you see dead children, you say, oh my God, how can Israel do that. And it's it's just a tactic that Hamas has perfected. It's a brilliant tactic, but only dumb people could fall for it or people who want to fall for it. And I think a lot of people have fallen for this tactic without realizing that the fault lies with Hamas. They commit double war crimes. They fire rockets at Israeli civilians from behind their own civilians. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Case for Moral Clarity, and the cover was a cartoon. And the cartoon said it all. It was an Israeli soldier standing in front of a baby carriage, protecting the baby. And it was a Hamas soldier standing behind the baby carriage, using the baby carriage to protect him. And that's the difference. That's what's so morally clear. But people won't accept it. But can a party that embraces intersectionality ever be pro-Israel? It doesn't, it doesn't. No, no, of course not. And intersectionality, you know, they say privilege, white privilege. But there's no such thing as Muslim privilege. You know, many of the people in college 
campuses today are extraordinarily wealthy Muslims who come from Saudi Arabia and other countries. But if you're a Muslim, you get a pass. You're part of intersectionality. But if you're a Jew, you don't get a pass. You can get a pass if you announce you're a virulent anti-Zionist and you hate you know, the Jewish influence on politics, then you can get a pass. But if you are either quiet about Israel or pro-Israel, then you cannot get the support of the intersectionality people. And I saw a little parallel, as kind of a dead giveaway. All the attention to this AP building being blown up. Yeah. From the same people who during the BLM riots, while innocent people were having their businesses destroyed, were saying, it's just property, destruction of property is not violence, they're insured, all, all, the, all the dismissals of the lives ruined Look, during the looting. But the AP building, this is serious, right? Yeah, it's such hypocrisy. First of all, we now know, they're, they're from 2016, we now know that people from the AP knew that there were Hamas um, uh, uh, headquarters there, number one. Uh, number two, you know, the people from AP got out of the building and said, we're lucky we weren't killed. They weren't lucky, they were <laughs> warned. They were warned, they got phone calls saying you have an hour to leave the building and the building was blown up, big deal. Now Israel has offered to rebuild the AP part of the building, which I don't think they should do, but they, they, they are prepared to do it. You're absolutely right. Why suddenly do socialists and left-wingers care so much about, about business buildings. People didn't live there. These were, you know, these were office buildings and uh, the same people who want to destroy uh, police stations and, and businesses, even black businesses. There's such hypocrisy. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time in my life, my whole life, I've said this before, my whole life, I always followed politics very closely, but it was mostly, mostly entertainment. I never really felt that anything that I was following or any decision that was made was really going to affect me that much they raised my taxes lower my taxes whatever but it didn't really but in the last few years starting with the louis thing then with the rioting that was going on in new york city where it was pretty clear the police had been told to stand down and that if and that if i lost everything you know that it would be dismissed as a white person's complaint um m most recently and i'm not crying poverty i'll be fine even if i don't get the money but there is a government program to help the restaurants get out from under all the bills that we've incurred in the last couple of years, right? And I can't get that money. I may never get it because it, the business is owned by a white male and the, pro, the program will probably be out of money by the time it gets to white males. Now, the irony is that my wife is a person of color and if it was just in her name, I'd you know, I'd have the cash by now. But the idea, that, the idea that all of a sudden, like if, if there's a hurricane on my street and my house is destroyed and my black neighbor's house is destroyed, that this this bears on who gets uh, money. This is a this is a huge it's a sea change. It's a huge change. And, and it's wrong it, either yeah. way, wrong in New Orleans when there wasn't enough attention played to the losses in the black community. Right. That was wrong, too. Uh, you know, we have to ultimately the goal has to be to become colorblind. The goal has to be Martin Luther King's dream. The goal has to be total and complete equality, not in quality of outcome, but equality of opportunity. But we're moving away from that. And but I do you see do you, do you see a realistic way to get there or is it just beyond the human capacity? You know, certain things we just maybe can't do as 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 human beings. I mean, maybe it's beyond our um nature to be completely in the, colorblind in 1922 the most prominent jewish professor at harvard was a man named louis wolfson and he wrote an article in which he said being born jewish is like being born blind deaf or with a hunchback there's nothing you can do about it don't try to fight it it's inevitable it's inherent if you're a jew you will never have equality you will never have the opportunities that gentiles have he wrote that in 1922 I met him in 1964 when I first came to Harvard. And I said to him, that article had a big impact on me. I just rejected out of hand. And he said, well, you're a naive young man. You will learn the truth soon. But we overcame that. Um, you know, when I saw Jackie Robinson come to bat, I was nine years old in 1947. My first instinct was if Jackie Robinson can play second base for the Brooklyn Dodgers, I can do anything. And we have to instill that attitude back to Americans. Uh, you know, we are the land of opportunity. And I was privileged to teach some of the most unbelievable 
uh, young African Americans, men and women, who came up out of nowhere and are now judges and prominent professors. Uh, uh, we shouldn't knock the concept of opportunity. It's not going to work for everybody, but we can do a lot better. I mean, I'm, I'm such a patriotic American and I love my country so much and I love the ideal that honestly, if I thought it would work, I would accept the expediency over principle and I would let them treat me as a white. I, I, I mean, it, it's really not about me. I'm very fortunate. I'll be fine either way. But it's going to tear the country apart, in my opinion. And when you, I mean, you have small businesses, mom and pops. And if they want to organize, let's say, against the way this program is being administered, are they going to organize as white businesses now? Is that what we're going to force people to do? That's dangerous as hell. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Look, there, as you said, there are differences. Institutionally, our Constitution was based on a birth defect, and we are never going to get over that. And we do have to recognize that in everything we do. But there comes a time when the case for uh, colorblind equality um, is, is going to be here. Justice O'Connor said some years ago that affirmative action based on race should last 25 years, but ultimately it has to end and everybody has to be treated equally. Maybe it'll take more than 25 years, but that can't be the goal. The goal can't be identity politics, that we, we treat everybody differently based on their race, their gender, their identity, their sexual identity. The goal has to be that we treat everybody the same. We, we have to start by imagining what we want to look like as a eventually healthy society. Does that mean mm -hmm. that people of this color can never make food of that person's color and people of this color can never dress up as their heroes of the other color? That's not what we want. We, we, we want to imagine being beyond that. And if we want to be beyond that, we have to work to be beyond that. Instead, we're look, working to prevent being beyond that. When the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments were passed, if anybody in Congress had said, oh, by the way, this may be interpreted someday to allow a white man and a black woman to marry, it would have been defeated unanimously. There wasn't a single person in Congress who would have accepted into marriage based on, 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 on race. Today, it's a non-issue. Uh, we are a different country. We are a better country and we can get better and better and better. But the idea of reimposing racial segregation and hierarchies and substituting one hierarchy for another hierarchy is the road to hell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd said many, many times on this show in, in relation to this whole uh, Asians in the Ivy League, if Harvard was 70 percent Asian, nothing would make me more proud of my country. Of course, I mean, I mean we, we don't care. Anyway, Look, so that, that's exactly right. And uh, MIT is and some other schools uh, are very substantially uh, Asian American. Look, people work hard. People come up from where they were born and accomplish something. We have to give them credit for it. Absolutely. All right, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, Dan, do you have any final questions? Well, I just, I just, I just wanted to say, is this debate uh, being scheduled? Has it been scheduled? So our, our mutual friend Stephen Calabria is trying to get it off the ground. Go ahead. And this would be a debate on what was the the debate topic? Was Israel? Israel. I think some 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 aspect of Hamas, Israel. Um, I think it'd be interesting. I I love the debate I had there uh, last time, and um, it was just it was just a lot of fun. The you idea that a serious subject, but know that you can occasionally intrude some humor into it is, is a very healthy thing. I, I would you like you to, had a debate. Uh, Megan Kelly was the moderator, I believe. No, not Megan Kelly. Was it Megan Kelly? Harry with, Anton. with Harry Anton. Debate, no, no. I really had a debate on Israel with Megan Kelly being yeah, moderator. Oh, really? I wasn't there. No, it wasn't at the comedy. Oh, so I, I misheard you. I it was on her podcast. Ah. Oh, oh yeah, I heard that. That was great. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah, I said that's a lot of people. She did quite a good job, I thought. Yeah, well, she's terrific. She is terrific. She's a terrific moderator. She's very balanced. She's very smart. And uh, she's a lawyer, too. I, I would like to break the debate down. We'll talk about it, obviously, off the air. But I would like to break the debate down, if everybody's agreeable, into like four or five questions, a la the, the way you, you've you broken your book down, uh, The Case for Israel. Because um, I, I think it would be nice to have really pointed answers to these questions like are the settlements illegal and the various questions which go on. Great, great. Um, okay, do it. 
hey, keep making people laugh and keep making people think. And I have to tell you, one of the best ways to get people to think is to make them laugh. Yes, that's true. I, I can I ask you one more question, by the way, because sure. I, I once had a harebrained idea, but I want to know how far you take this free speech thing. I got shot down and I dropped it. But when we, we first started doing debates, it was a little bit before wokeness had really clouded up the entire sky. And I wanted to do a Holocaust denial debate. I, I wanted to, you know, lift up the rock and actually have a debate about whether the Holocaust happened or not. I thought as a way to air this out and, and to, to sh so that people wouldn't suspect stuff. And everybody told me that was a terrible idea. What would so you here's my response to that. I think there should be a debate. Did the Holocaust occur? But it should be part of a four part debate. One, is the earth flat? Two, <laughs> Is John F. Kennedy still alive and living in Hyannis? And uh, figure out the third one. Well, is but, Paul McCartney dead? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, if, if you want to have it as part of a debate like that, fine. But the idea that anybody could give any credibility, I mean, there would just be. Um, but, but I wouldn't ban it. I wouldn't ban Holocaust denial. I, I, when Holocaust denial has come to campuses, I use it as an opportunity to educate, because remember, 90% of the students don't know anything about the Holocaust. That's and right. if somebody comes and says it didn't occur, then they have to focus on it a little bit. And we know what the outcome of the debate is going to be. Obviously, we have all the evidences there. There are no survivors left. They're almost all now uh, dying. But we have all the evidence of every possible, mostly admissions by the Nazis who ran it uh, um, uh, during the Nuremberg trials and in other 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 venues and contexts. So I'm not afraid of debating anything. I think it would be good. People hear all these things like, you know, the 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 ovens couldn't have possibly or the gas chambers couldn't have possibly generated that much uh, gas to kill that number of people. And they hear these things and they never actually hear the response. And truthfully, I don't know the response. I know there is a response. Well, I know, I can't be and you know, one of the villains of this piece is Pat Buchanan. Yes. Cannon has toyed around with Holocaust denial. Once when there was a train that was stuck in Washington, D.C., and nobody was killed, he said that proved basically that the Zykon X couldn't do it. And so I challenged him. I said, why don't you go into a little chamber? I'll put some Zykon X in. If you emerge healthy, you win the debate. But if they carry you out, I win the debate. Now, he didn't take me up on it. But I, I, well, I know you have to go. But the other thing that I do want to talk about at some point is I'm so disappointed in our senator from New York, Charles Schumer, who did not say a word about Hamas during this entire thing. If, if there's any better indication of what the reality of the Democratic Party is today, I can't think of one. And he won't say a word about the squad. I mean, he calls himself Schumer, Shomer, the guardian of Israel. It's so easy to make those kinds of statements. But uh, I'm very disappointed. Uh, by him as well. New York has not been well served by its two uh, Democratic senators, not well served at all. Yeah. All right. Professor Dershowitz, I look forward to seeing you at the debate. We're going to try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and, will it be uh, catered by Il Molino? Oh, boy. wow. Okay. You if, got me. No, I'm, I'm saying, will it be? I don't know if it will uh, be. Okay. If that's what Professor Dershowitz likes, that's what he shall have. Love that. Of course. Um, Good. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, that's it. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Professor Zorshwood. See you Good soon. Bye-bye.